Welcome to Cattle Place. Uh, this time we're going to do a new Let's Play series and we're going to start as the United Tribes. So why have I chosen United Tribes for this playthrough? Number one is that developers have explicitly stated in one of their developer diaries that they consider United Tribes to be the most difficult start in the game. So I wanted to take up that challenge. Number two is the Maori people have a very interesting history that I would like to explore here. So from now on, I'm going to try and talk about the history of every country that I play as. And another new change in this series will be that I will try to cut out most of the bone out of the meat here. That is, I will try to edit out these videos so we get more interesting content and less me trying to micromanage the markets. So we don't have to skip around too much in these videos. Speaking of skipping around, now if you do want to skip this next part, feel free to do so, but I have prepared a small video about the history of Maori people up to 1836, which you're welcome to watch right now. So let's transport ourselves to the distant shores of Taiwan, where the Polynesian ancestors hail from. The people that colonized the whole of Pacific Ocean, of course, were no strangers to seafaring. They have developed what were probably the most sophisticated forms of seafaring available to pre-industrial people, such as double-decked canoes, which allowed them to store more supplies and maintain stability in uneasy waters. Moreover, Polynesians maintain an oral tradition of extremely advanced navigation techniques, such as their ability to notice and memorize ocean flows, map out and track stars, and notice the migratory patterns of birds to determine where land existed. This allowed them to colonize the ocean as far as Tahiti and Hawaii, until they finally reached the shores of New Zealand in around 1200 AD. The newly landed Polynesian people settled in a region which was much more different from their ancestral home. The islands were huge compared to the small archipelagos they were used to, and they were considerably colder and more inhospitable. The Maori ancestors spread through the islands and hunted down the local moa bird species to extinction, forcing them to settle down and start an agricultural lifestyle, using fortified villages, or pa, for defense of the lands. Their attitude for fortifications will come in handy much later, but for now they have abandoned their seafaring ways and lost contact with their Polynesian cousins. Despite their isolation though, they still maintained a strong oral tradition. For example, while most Polynesians correctly identify their Hawaiki or ancestral home where their spirits go to rest to be in the west, the Maori believed it to be eastwards, showing that they did understand that they originated from the Tahiti and Tonga archipelagos. Extensive contact with Europeans started in the 19th century, just as the game starts. This period is defined by having access to two goods, muskets and potatoes. Muskets allowed certain hapu, or sub-tribes, to get advantage over their neighbors and attack them with superior weaponry in surprise, while potatoes were much easier to farm than local crops and thus allowed men to travel and fight in battles for longer periods of time. The result completely changed the Maori society. Most had to flee to one place or another, thus creating new societies which were no longer as dependent on their heritage, or as it was known, whakapapa. And that is important because this is where we see a start of communities that are established on the basis of civic belonging rather than shared genealogy and heritage, or whakapapa. The Maori had also developed new methods for trench warfare which were never seen before. Their fortified villages, Paz, could withstand extended sieges for years. They were the first ones to develop such trench warfare techniques. That is important to remember. As the musket wars were raging on, the confederation known as the United Tribes of New Zealand was assembled. It was not a real state in any practical sense. The British resident James Busby assembled 52 Rangatira, or chiefs of those sub-tribes, Hapas, to form a very formal union which would allow them to fly the flag what we can see in the game. This was just so that the Maori could trade with other British subjects, as the maritime law demanded them to have some sort of a flag, otherwise their ships would be seized. And this is where we find ourselves in 1836. And 
time. Thank you for watching that short video. Now, be aware that I'm not an expert on Maori history, but if you do want to learn more, there's a great podcast I can recommend, which is called History of Aotearoa. I'll drop a link below the video so that you can follow up on it if you are interested. If you're not interested in history, then you might want to skip this next part as well, since I'm just going to be quickly going through the situation that, that the United Tribes find themselves in the game at this point and what isn't as historically accurate as it could be. So first of all, we're playing as the United Tribes of New Zealand. So this was not an actual real state. It was an independent confederation of Maori chiefs, but it really just functioned as a sort of paper country to have a flag to trade with in the sense that it did not have any government institution. So it's not actually a centralized power. It did not have a prince. It did not have anyone in charge at all, as a matter of fact. And it's kind of interesting because uh, while the United Tribes are centralized in this game, Tahiti is not, which is strange because actually at this point in time, you could consider Tahiti to be a centralized state. So this is an interesting choice on the developer's part. Might be an oversight, but that's fine. I think a much better candidate for a centralized state in New Zealand would have been Ngati Toa, which was a country led by a person known as the Napoleon of the South, who was pushed out of this area here and moved downwards during the Musket Wars and managed to conquer this large area. So all of this area is ruled by a single chief, Orangatira, and that's quite impressive and as centralized as it gets at the current stage uh, for Maori people. So that's one kind of inconsistency that we have here, but uh, I want to get into the laws as well. So first of all, it's uh, a monarchy, which <laughs> it doesn't really map well on the uh, Maori people at this point, doesn't map well on the United Tribes. Now, that is not to say that this is incorrect. I just don't know what else would work here. Uh, so it is what it is. Additionally, I would not say it's an oligarchy either. Actually, at this point, probably it would be safe to consider the Maori people to be more equal than the traditional aristocratic countries of Eastern Europe. But that is just a situation that is difficult for developers to map map onto the current engine. Maybe in the future there will be more forms of sort of government institutions that uh, could work much better with some decentralized but still sort of centralized states like for example the United States which are by the way incorrectly presidential elective well, at this point, the president did not have all the power in the United States, so it should be a parliamentary country, but whatever. So there's inconsistencies all over the place. This is not just with the United Tribes, right? And so that is something that will perhaps be changed in the future. Now, looking into the laws, there's another law that I disagree with. So it says here that the slavery is banned. That is incorrect. Slavery was not banned in New Zealand until 1840, and the Maori people, as most people in history of the world did practice slavery while it was not like the centerpiece of the Maori economy or anything like that it was still practiced up until let's say 1860s I don't know the exact date but it was phased out slowly so this is another inconsistency that we have and the last one is actually I think something that the United Tribes should have from the very start is a specific military technology. Now, you remember me talking about the trench works that they have developed, and I think that field works, at least field works, should be unlocked immediately for the Maori, if not trench works. Because when I was referring to the uh, trench works that they had for the fortified pause in, during the musket wars, this stands. So the Maori people had a lot of military innovations that were not available to the rest of the world at the time. And it would be just interesting to see certain countries and not just, uh, you know, the United Tribes of New Zealand, but certain countries over over the whole world that did actually have access to these advances before everyone else figured it out. And there's many others that I could be talking about. But for the United Tribes, this is the one that I wish they had. But other than that, there's a lot of 
things that are quite accurate as well. So we do have a northern island that is more populous than the southern island, and that was actually true. Perhaps the population for the southern island should be even lower because the northern island was way more populous, way more than this. But soon enough, you'll see that in the game, I think there's about 150,000 people living on northern island and around how many do we have here? Yeah, 70,000 roughly in the southern island. So that is correct. But what's incorrect is this tract of land is owned by the New South Wales. That's not true. There was no permanent colony in New Zealand at 1836. There were trading posts, true, but no actual colony. So this should not be here. I think that the United Tribes being under the British Empire sort of as a colony or perhaps a protectorate is more correct. And it already shows that the British Empire did have influence over these two islands. And that is enough. I don't think that this colony here is needed. It's a historical and it should ideally be removed. But other than that, I don't want to sound like I'm criticizing the game. So let's just get into the game right now. Let's draw up some goals. So first of all, what I want to do with the United Tribes of New Zealand, I want to industrialize. Uh, the reason for that being is that we have a very low population and industrialization should work quite well for us. We can get all of our population on a high standard of living, which will invite immigrants into the country. And we want to take advantage of that. So this is why, first of all, I want to start the industrialization. Additionally, with this massive industrialization and quite easy industrialization, I must say, must say we will make the aristocrats lose all of their power since there will be no more peasants. They depend on peasants for their power and they will lose it. The landowners will not be a problem soon enough. So that's not something that we need to worry about. Next up is I want to invest into colonization. Uh, the reason being is that my goal is to unite Aotearoa or New Zealand as it's known in the Maori language. So for that, I'll need colonization. At the moment, I don't have any technology to perform colonization, so I'll need to focus on that. Additionally, and that's our next goal, is to invest into healthcare. Because we have a very low population, we can gamble with that. Even small percentages mean quite a lot for us, and the more population we have, the healthier our economy is going to be. So, without further ado, we can now start playing the technologies that we want to invest in. So that's colonization. Um, that's something that we're going to do. Next up, what I want to do is start building some sort of a industry. Let's see which one is the most profitable. Looks like food industries is going to win out. Yep. Let's start with the food industries. I'm not going to do any resource industries for now because guess what? We're in the British market, so we can take advantage of that. We don't have to build the pyramid from the bottom up. We can start with the top immediately. Now, next up, barracks. We're not looking to get into any wars with anybody, so I want to reduce that to one. And it's going to be at one because I still want to take advantage of the ability to bribe the military into being approving of us since right now they're this. And I'm going to go for very low taxes. I'm fine with them being quite low. Since we cannot change a lot of laws right now, we lack technologies for them, but I do want to go into professional army as soon as possible. So let's do that. Let's just spend some of our authority for road maintenance, social mobility, and encouraging manufacturing industry, since soon we will have that manufacturing industry going on for us. Next up, what I want to do is I want to improve relations with Britain so that they don't decide to annex us. So that's pretty much all you need to do to avoid that. Uh, I'm also going to be improving relations with all of our other neighbors. Oh, well, that's unfortunate. My last goal would have been to expand into the Polynesian area, but I suppose that the Brits have other ideas about it. Oh, look at that. We have professional army now. Uh, we have gained this, so this will lower the power of landowners as well, which is good. And as you can see, they're already losing clout. My thinking is that since the aristocracy will lose their power anyway, landed voting would not be a bad idea. So I'm just going to go with that one. Let's look at our interest groups while we're waiting for all of our industries. But whoa, well, that passed quickly. <laughs> Congratulations, we have landed voting. So that's cool. We're going to have parties and stuff. So we have new parties that formed in the country, which are none. Either way, let's see. Are there ideas? 
Okay, so that's good for us. So landowners are jingoist, which means that they want colonization. That's good. Let's see armed forces. They're moderate, but by default, as I understand, they already like. We have a good coalition for when we actually finish research and colonization. The results are in, and uh, yeah, we have the conservative party and the patriotic parties. We still are building our food industries. After that, we're going to expand the port and then just keep building some additional industries here. And we have finally built the food industries here. So what do we have now? Let's just unpause and look at our GDP explode. Whoop. Yep, this is going higher and higher. Yeah, our GDP is growing. And now we have number two GDP per capita worldwide. The ruling landowners led by charismatic Te Atta Iheke has initiated a great promotional tour. The decision to focus efforts domestically or internationally have been left to the last minute. However, it's unclear if landowners will do more for itself or the country's whole. Let's do it for the country. Thank you. Thank oh, look. That allows us to begin influencing other countries as well. That's good. And we got our colonization unlocked, which allows us to have plus two max colonial affairs institution investment. I'm so happy about this. I'm just going to whoa, 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 wait. We need to pass the law. OK, and here we go. We got our colonial resettlement. So let's let's just get this Wellington spot here. Look what's going to happen. Ta-da! <laughs> we got the full province for ourselves, except we have to share it with these people, but whatever. Uh, so we're going to just start colonizing here as well. And as you can see, the speed is terrible. So we're just going to expand our colonial institutions. Boom. The petite bourgeoisie want appointed progress, and they're very angry about it. I'm OK with that. Let's do it. Now, after grabbing this small piece of land, our population almost doubled. We can now have more factories fully functional. So it's 15,000 peasants. Ooh. No, it's actually good news. Okay, 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 okay. So, so, so I'm just going to go with, we will spare no expense. Let's get this past. So great news for us. So we finally have appointed bureaucrats. That's incredible. So it rarely happens so quickly. And I think the, the reason for that is that they have changed the way that interest groups work in the late dispatch. So now they actually do want to have progressive legislation sometimes as well. So that means that we actually get laws that we would want anyway. And we have industrial boom. We are having a very lucky run here, except for the British. But as long as they leave the sovereign island alone, I'm OK with that. Oh, dear, we got gold uh, standard of living on the rise. Gold doing well and literacy rates increasing. This is going quite well. I don't know what they're talking about when they're saying that this is a difficult start. Uh, colonial affairs institution to level two. That is good for us as well. Let's see the colonization speed should be held. So the British are actually going to move out against the Tahitians. Should I side with Britain? Maybe they will like me more. OK, Britain, I'm, I'm coming to your help against my cousins. We're brothers in arms now. I'll leave it to you, Britain. Win that war. Make us proud. We are doing quite well with gold here. Gold in the South Island. But this is <laughs> these are going to be the richest decentralized state in the whole of Victoria 3. Let's see. GDP is exploding. And we got medical degrees unlocked. Ah, OK, this is very important for us. Let's continue going to pharmaceuticals. And in the meantime, let's get the Anglican Church into the government because we want charity hospitals. Let's go for it. I think we can remove these barracks at this point. We don't need the military anymore. We really needed them just to pass colonization laws. So now that we have this, it's going great. Popular playwright endorses reform. That is great because 15% is not enough. In the midst of debates surrounding charity hospitals, one of the country's leading playwrights strongly associated with the Anglican Church has staged a widely acclaimed Play whose political laden theme makes no secret of the author's desire for law to be passed. And it should be on everybody's lips right now. I don't even know. We have number one GDP per capita in the world right now. And our standard of living is also number one in the world. So that's nothing to scoff at. That is great news for us. So grassroots support for the law, the political wills and desires of the lower classes will always remain an opaque matter for whatever reason. Support for charity hospitals. Yeah, I wonder why has spread like wildfire. This is crazy. Why would they want healthcare? Public enthusiasm expedite reform. We now have charity hospitals, which allows us to have some sort of a healthcare system. Yay, which means that our mortality 
has now dropped 2.2%, while our birth rate is 3.7%. This is amazing news. And I think that this is a good place to end the first episode. So thank you for watching this. We are doing great. We have 600,000 K in terms of GDP. We're number one in terms of GDP per capita. We're way ahead of Hamburg. So second that Hamburg. And we have almost 40% literacy, which is great. Number one standard of living in the world. How about that? Almost 100,000 people living here. We have charity hospitals, so our population is expanding rapidly. And we're slowly colonizing the Southern Island. So everything is going well for us. So come back to see us expand in the Southern Island and keep growing our industries. Thank you for watching and see you next time.